So I'm waiting for, I don't remember exactly how many people we are in this class, but I should check on that. Uh, I also, we have had issues um, with the graphic tablet stuff. So if you went to the library yesterday, you probably were not able to borrow one. Um, it will be done before the end of the week. I was going to ask. Did you did you try? Um, I was going to. I just remember you said you were going to sit down tomorrow. Yeah, it it, it should be fixed by tomorrow. Happens. It should be fixed by tomorrow, but uh, it's always you know first week is always just setting things up, and that's part of it. So yeah, still waiting for a few, few, a few. Uh. Yeah. So today we really are going to discuss like the, the basics of the basics. Uh, and if you wonder why I'm red, it's totally because it's so gray outside that I'm like, okay, the night may as well come sooner. And all my lights in my apartment are red. So you know, there you go. I have um, the sneezing uh, syndrome, like, you know, when you look at the sun, it makes you sneeze. And I have that with bright lights as well, and it gives me headaches. So that's why I, I'm not just trying to look sinister or anything like that. I just, you know, live in red. Um, Did I say anything that may have misled students into thinking that we did not have class today? That's what I assume, yeah. Um, <coughs> well, that sucks because, uh, I mean, that's a class, you know, this is a class about basics, but that's kind of... Thank me later. Yeah, so that's a, a class where I actually usually appreciate to have a bit of attendance because we are really going to talk about the, the basics of uh, that's where I actually usually appreciate to have the basics of Photoshop, the basic of digital painting, but really the basic basic. Like we are going to talk about how you sit at your computer first of all. You know. Um, Let's start with that, you know, let, let's start talking about that. Just before we go there, like, do you have any questions about the syllabus and the thing that I, uh, you know, that we talked about the last time? Mm. So, I have been doing that for 20 years, I think, and I still don't have too many back issues. I mean, I had back issues before, but it, let's just say it did not get worse. Uh, because I have a good chair, okay? Um, and uh, I'm very, very aware that I spend probably almost, that sounds sad, but maybe 15 hours a day sometime in front of my computer, right? And I have known that for a long time. 
and uh, you are probably doing the same already. You probably spend a lot of time in front of your computer. And so um, if your life is going to be, whether you keep going with digital painting or, or if it's about any, any kind of work that is computer based, uh, you will have to deal absolutely with the right posture uh, or else you will just destroy your back and quit, not because you don't like what you do, but because because you will get yourself uh, a back injury, and I'm really not kidding, uh, or get some carpal tunnel issues, you know? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about with that, but so, um, so this is, you know, before we even talked about Photoshop or anything like that, I think it's very essential that uh, you get that in mind, like your relationship with your computer is something you should actually think about. For example, I know a lot of students in class, for example, sitting at their computer with, you know, on their back like that with the computer over them. And they are in a way kind of dominated by their computer. And I will highly advise against that. <laughs> I know some of you are already like, oh shit, what is that? But, um, <coughs> I like to look down at my computer. And I think it's important because that's what allows you to like sit straight, look down at the computer and have the right posture that is not killing your back. Um, and also, you know, you are kind of in control, like your eyes just have to like nicely lay down on what you are doing and you can do that for a long time. Uh, so that's important. Um, the right posture. Another thing that I do, and this is especially for carpal tunnel, I use pads. And I know that looks like ridiculous, but this is important because that means that every time I work, my arm is resting and my hand is kind of falling on the graphic tablet with a pad right there. Instead of having like my wrist and my forearm laying in front of the angle, like on the angle of the, tab of the table that is just kind of, you know, cutting circulation, like it just, it's just not good to, that posture is not good because you have to break your wrist when you, when you work. So be over your table and have a pad so you can just simply draw like that. You will really, really avoid carpal tunnel just with that. And this is a real deal, you know, there are many artists and friends of mine who I have seen posting online that they have not been able to work for a while because they just got a, a hand injury. It's a real deal. Uh, it's okay when you do that for fun, you can take a break, but when you make a living with this, you kind of need it, you know, uh, obviously. So uh, domination over your computer, pads, stuff that makes that you don't you don't have sharp angles against you when you work. Uh, and that's quite important. And I'm saying I'm saying this, but I have a monitor that is above my head. So sometimes you see me looking up, but even that is already like requiring an effort, and it's already like I don't know. It's a different feel, and I don't like this. So I will. Um, at some point get rid of that higher up monitor. Plus that makes me look crazy when I talk looking at it like that. It makes me look like I'm going to deliver some kind of weird prophecy or something like that. Um, so I literally had a student who thought I was acting superior because I was looking up and they thought I was eye rolling at them. Um, fun. So your posture is important. Um, taking breaks really important. If you find yourself spending more than one hour in front of your computer without standing up, uh, you are making a mistake. You know, I usually go two hours before I, I remember that I, I do have to, you know, one class time is good, but after one class time, take a break. Uh, when you work, same thing, you know, try to, try to always remember to stretch and, you know, just stuff like that. And again, I know that sounds weird to talk about this, but I think it's essential. I think we get too used to sitting in front of a screen and, and not caring about those stuff. Uh, and yes, I'm going to be the guy who is also going to recommend some, a bit of exercise and stuff like that just to stay in shape and not get too much of that um, digital artist routine that, that ultimately like 40 years down the line will start to hurt you. Um, I think it's important to think about that. If you are going for the long run, if you know that's going to be your life, I think you should think about that.
Photoshop. Okay, just let me check the, my Discord server as well. No, I literally have students just not showing up. Okay. Um, did I say I was really cool on attendance the last time? Did I say that? Because that may be the mistake I did, you know, telling students, oh, I'm cool with attendance, you know. Usually I wait for the end of the semester to say that, and I said it, I said it too early. Like, no, we have like five students in the wild with their parents being like, you're not in class? And they're like, no, he's cool with attendance, so I can miss class one, you know. Um, I'm thinking right now, am I going to like, you know, if I have students missing this class, I feel like there are a lot of things that I need everyone to be here before I talk about that, but at the same time, it's, it's their fault, you know, so. Um, I want to talk about some of the things we are going to talk about this semester that are essential, really essential. And those are the things that, even if you had the 2D foundations before that, even if you learn basics of painting, uh, I really want to discuss those things with you directly and talk about it my way, you know. So this way, I'm certain that we define some level of, um, I don't know, demands from me. I, so this way, when I demand stuff from you, when I expect things from you, I know I base my expectations on things that I have told you, okay? And so, <coughs> We are going to talk about values, we are going to talk about color theories, we are going to talk about composition a lot. <coughs> and we are going to start with values, specifically values, because to me, uh, values are the most essential skill uh, to learn how to paint. Are you, uh, are you familiar with what value means? This is what I call the, and by the way, like, you know, during my classes, I will, I will have Photoshop on and showing you a lot of stuff right now. Uh, I'm not doing that right now, but I will. Uh, to make a very simple um, definition of values, um, I like to just say light and shadows. It's that simple, light and shadows. And the way I explain values to my students is by talking about you know, I'm, I'm actually a bit pissed off that um, some students are missing this class because that means that I will have to repeat that. Uh, this is really important and whatever. When you are in the complete dark, and I'm not going to, sorry if I make you feel stupid, but by saying very, very basic stuff, but uh, when you are in complete dark, you see nothing, all right? And you see stuff only when someone or yourself, take a torch or a lighter or a candle and light it. And as soon as you do that, well, that's why I have that light right now in front of me, because I know the direction of it. And you can see that the red light that I have is hitting my fingers on top of the finger and projecting some shadows under my fingers. Right, so understanding light <coughs> and shadows, understanding values, is the key for you to be able to paint volume. <coughs> and I know that uh, no matter how much you talk about values, uh, sometime in 2D foundations, for a lot of students, that, that connection between painting in volumes, painting in a realistic way, creating depth in your artwork, creating perspective, most of the time that mental connection between values and 3D is forgotten. And so the light source is what creates that game of light and shadows on you, on me right now as I talk to you. You can see the shadow of my nose, you can see the shadow of my hands on my face right now. And if you look at everyone's in the meeting, you can see the way the light and the shadows are affecting your face as well and create that depth. Uh, and it would be the same if I was flashing some bright light on me, you know, we will lose shadows, we will lose the details and I will become that almost that flat surface. <coughs> And so understanding light and shadows and light direction 
is the best, uh, well, it's the most fundamental thing to learn when we start painting. You will find out later that when we start talking about colors, colors are a bit less complicated to learn and understand once you have a stable understanding of values. And this is why the first project is a black and white project. All right. This is why I really want to focus on that. And this is why I told you I do not want any color in your initial project. It is not because as some students sometimes assume, it's not because I want your method to be I draw and paint in black and white and then I color it. That's not, that's not the reason why I do this. This is, in fact, this idea of black and white first and then I color it is very, it's very uh, kindergarten almost. It's very color book stuff, you know, like I get something and I color it, I color inside. And this is not the relationship I have with color at all and this is not what I'm going to teach you when you color your artwork. So the reason why we work in black and white is not because it is the first step before color. It's because I want you to practice values. So we work in black and white because, um, because this way you will just learn how to sculpt with light and shadows more than to paint almost. That means that that first project that we have um, is a project where it's okay if you don't think too much about the right proportions if you struggle to get it. It's okay if you... Um, if your line work is not perfect, I want you to focus more on am I able to build volume by playing with shades of gray? Am I making sense with that? Um, if I look annoyed, it's because I am. It's because I know that there is like at least four people right now who should really hear what I'm saying and who are not here. Uh, what's going to happen is that they are going to ask me what they missed and I'm going to be myself and tell them, well, you missed it, so how would I know? And I would probably send them to you, all of you, to get some feedback on that class because and you don't have a duty to answer to them. You can if you want, but, you know, the reason why I'm not too tough on attendance, it's because I count on students' responsibility. So when you... When you decide to miss a class, I'm okay with that. I don't care, I'm, I'm not someone who is you know, punishing people for that. Um, but do not, do not consider that uh, I have the responsibility to go back and reteach something that I taught. And of course, you are the ones who don't need to hear this because you are, you are right here. So um, I want to talk about what I call the digital radical, okay? And I'm not sharing my screen with you right now because, and I will do that a lot. I will talk about digital stuff. I will talk about uh, Photoshop things without sharing my screen sometime also because I found out that it works better if you just memorize it, if you just visualize it. And so sometimes I will talk about something without sharing my screen and then I will share my screen to like kind of double up on it. But at first I want you to think about that. I just want you to think about concepts, basic concepts. One of the things that, uh, see for example, I know, I know that my graphic tablet is black, right? But if I show it to you right now, it's not black. If I was to color fit right here, I would have a dark gray. I would have some red right here. So I know it's black, but it's not full black, okay? It's not like the full black, the digital full black that you, you will pick if you were to use the color picker in Photoshop, right? And so the full black in Photoshop or the full white in Photoshop is what I call digital radicals. They are level of black or level of white that do not exist outside of the digital world. Does that make sense? And it's excessively essential because that means that when you learn how to paint, when you learn how to paint with Photoshop, in a way, as soon as you use this radical black or this radical white, you are using something that does not exist in nature. So in a way, I'm tempted to tell you, don't use it. Does that make sense? 
I'm going to explain that to you as well in a very simple way. When you use something that is very, very dark but not full black, or very, very bright but not full white, it means you still have a bit of margin in between full black, in between very, very dark and full black, and between very, very bright and full white. You still have that little margin where, um, where you can still get a bit brighter or a bit darker if you need to. As soon as you use full black or full white, you hit a wall. You cannot go past this. You have no options anymore. Am I making sense with that? And I know those are simple concepts. You know, you don't need to be excessively intelligent <laughs> to understand that. Uh, personally, as a moron, I understand this very easily. Um, let me say hi in the chat. So um, this understanding that you should not go full white or full black is very important because that will prevent you from hitting what I call the digital wall of the digital radicals. But that implies another thing. What I'm talking about implies another thing. Well, a few other things. First of all, some of you will like to print their work. It's becoming less and less common. Even myself, for example, I used to show my work in galleries and I used to work with uh, printing in mind. And today, every time I'm offered to offer my, to, to show my work in a gallery, I just, I just don't have the energy. I'm not interested. Like, and the reality is, and it's a sad one, it is weird and sad, but I'd rather post my stuff on Facebook where I have like hundreds of thousands of followers on that and having my images be seen all over the place rather than spending money printing 20 pieces, showing it in a gallery that will be visited by maximum 500 people during a month. Most of them just going there because it, like, it has no interest for me. Like, I want my images to be seen. I want my work to be known, for example. You know, I don't care that much about that anymore, but um, if we make images, if we paint, it's, it's to show it to some people. But in the digital age, printing your work is something that is not a priority anymore. It's still interesting for, uh, it is still interesting for collectors. I have a lot of people asking for prints of my artwork, for example, so I make good prints for this. It is still important, obviously, for client work who print. So when you do, when you work for a magic card, when you do a book cover, when you do any, anything that is going to be printed material, you need to think about printing your work. And when you need to think about that, that is where the printers struggle. If you have a lot of full black, it will create a problem for the printing machine. It will bleed, depending on the, the, the kind of print you do. So be aware of this. And the last and most major application of what I'm telling you right now is the fact that if there is a radical black and a radical white that are walls that you cannot pass, it means that you should work on a canvas that is in the middle. So when you open Photoshop and start to draw, you should not draw on a white surface. You should work on a gray surface. Because this way, you can add some dark and create your shadow. And you can add some light and create your light. And I know this sounds also basic, but I will bet money on the fact that some of you, even with some experience of painting, some of you start on a white canvas. And that white canvas means that you can only go darker. You can only build your shadow. You realize how much you are like limiting yourself by doing this? So when I say gray canvas, you don't have to go like exactly middle gray, it does not matter. You can go like, but just make sure it's not full white or full black. Make sure you work on a surface that is somewhere in the middle so you can add some light and add some shadow. So that for some of you, if, if it's a big revelation right now, don't feel bad because it's normal actually. We, we take 
and and that's a topic I also want to to discuss with all of you right now. We take a lot of our traditional methods and habits to digital. We do that a lot, and in a way, that's a mistake. We have we have a tendency to we always draw with a black pencil on a white piece of paper. And so it's only natural for us to start working with Photoshop with you know dark colors on a white piece of paper. But the reality is Photoshop is a new tool. It's not just made to imitate. You know, digital painting softwares are not made to just imitate what we would do on paper or else just do it on paper. So digital technology offer offers us a lot of more advanced way to work, and you should take advantage of those. So you should be able, I'm going to start sharing my screen because, you know, let's, let's do that a bit, um, and show you how I work. Well, no, that's, that's, that's strong language right now. I'm going to make a few value marks all over my, oh my gosh, that's right. Um, Share that Photoshop screen, maybe. Come on. Okay, so you should be seeing a seeing a white. I'm going to share it with the chat on on Twitch as well. Um, if I remember how that works. So people on the stream, you should be able to see. You should be able to see my, my canvas as well. Um, so, so again, when I look up, it's because I have all my students on a monitor on top of me. Uh, remove your rings when you paint, also, or do what you want. So to just clearly show you what I'm doing with with this. Um, I usually work on a canvas that I will just, you know, drop something like that, maybe maybe lighter. But later when we talk about colors, and that's something that you should also think about, if for example you know you are painting a, a desert scene, you know, or something underwater, for example, start with a canvas that has like some hints of blue, for example. You know, if I'm going to start painting underwater or at night, I may start with a canvas. If I'm painting a night scene, I may start with a canvas like that. And I know I can get darker, I know I can get brighter, but that, that already gives some kind of undertone um, to the painting. But because we, again, the first project is in black and white, so here we are, black and white start. Now, let me show you something, um, something that will clearly illustrate the point I was trying to make earlier about radicals. Okay, so we have black and white, okay? Well, the thing is, I did cheat on that. I tell you it's black, you think it's black, you see black, and you think, but, and that illustrates exactly what I, I'm trying to tell you, is that look at what I do if I use full black on it. You see the difference between a black that I told you was black, but it's not black. I knew it was a shade of gray. I knew I was not going full black. What I'm telling you is that going dark is completely good. You can go darker in your values, but this is the, the margin you have with a very dark, from very dark to full black. And look at that white. That white is, in comparison, quite bright, right? Oops, I failed. What am I doing? Oh, I guess, okay, all right. I failed my demonstration. That was full white. Ish. So, 
So what I'm trying to explain to you in a semi uh, entertaining way is that if this is radical white and by the way when you talk about radical colors like that uh, this is this is a vocabulary that I employ but I don't think you can find that on the internet like this is just my way to explain that and if this is radical black if we name this one number zero and if this one is number 10 I want you you know and this is five I want you to work and please don't count I probably made a mistake of okay we have five here four here whatever I want you to work in between one and nine this is your workspace do not do not go to the radical does that make sense so the situation where you do sometimes go for something radical is and same thing I'm not going to show you that we will have time for this but think about you paint a portrait okay actually let's do that uh, I just posted this one online earlier let me find that it's somewhere Sorry, I'm just literally looking for some of my artwork in the middle of that computer. I'm just going to pick it from online. So you see that portrait there are some things that I like to talk about when looking at this painting it's a painting of a friend that I made uh, a lot of you will make the mistake of painting the eyes white where really the white of the eye is never white it's just completely influenced by context if you look at my eyes right now on camera this is not white like they are red okay but the only time I used a radical white in the work was when I dropped just a little dot of shine in the eye. So basically I keep the radicals for really, really the, like, the complete final touch. And you could think that the background is full black, but it's not at all. Once again, it's not. See, I'm just doing some full black over it. It's not, it's really dark, but it's not full black. And I don't know if the white in the eyes is actually still full white. So I just color pick the white in the eyes. All right, I'm doing it again, color picking that. So there are several whites in the eyes, but if I put a radical white in it, here you go. So you see how bright those dots in the eyes look like, and yet they are not. See the one on the nose? That's the color of it. So hopefully this is interesting for you. Uh, we will talk about all those stuff a lot more, okay? But I want you to like be exposed to this kind of early um, because that's the way, um, yeah, I like to start with like straight into what I consider is, um, yeah, something, something that I guess learning some things with a knowledge of the things we will talk about more in depth later is kind of giving you a, almost like a, a light beam, a, a light source in the, in the distance that you can follow. Uh, I'm supposed to rasterize that bit. Okay, all right. And so 
this is the black and white work. This is the work of values in it. Um, and that really highlights the way that work is built in volumes, you know, in shades of gray. So what we do have when we start to look at this, and again, we will, we will talk about this stuff with a lot more uh, details and intensity, but we have a light that comes kind of this way and it hits the tip of the nose, the chin, okay? The light comes all this way. That means that when the light hits one way, you have on the opposite shadow. Light, shadow. That's the way volume works. That's the way, again, we will, we will get to that a lot more in depth in the upcoming classes. Does any of you, like, do you have any questions about that? Is that a good, um, do you feel that you are learning already? I need to know that, you know, as a professor, I will, I will ask you that sometime because the day I ask my students, do you feel like you are learning? And everyone is like, nope, it means I have to modify my methods and, um, you know, just do better, I guess. Um, so again, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to specify that for the people who are on the stream right now. This is a class I'm teaching to my students. So I'm with some some students of mine in class, and I'm sharing uh, with you live uh, the things that I'm talking about right now. And today is the very, very first basic class that um, I plan to teach. I hope I am able to keep the recording on stream, but I probably made the mistake of not saving those stuff. So for the students who miss that class, this could have served uh, that purpose, but oh, whatever, you know, that's the price of missing my classes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's talk about, so I wanted to really give everyone an introduction of on, on, on values and the way I want you to, I know I repeat myself right now, but stay away from radical white, radical black, right there. And so same thing, that, that will be obviously a big uh, conversation topic, but when you work in digital painting, for the ones of you who have never worked with digital painting, I will share with you some brushes that you can use, but that's how your brushes should be set up. I am not changing the opacity in Photoshop right now, okay? I'm not changing anything, it just depends on the pressure I'm putting on my stylus right now. So. This way you don't have, you know, it reacts like, like, like a normal brush work and you don't have to do what you will do with the mouse and reduce the opacity, turning up and down. You don't, I don't want you to do that. I want you to deal with your opacity this way because, oh, by the way, same thing, I, I'm going to keep illustrating this, but if you think that this is radical black, no, it's not. Once again, you know, even the darkest spot was not black. Um, Working this way will allow you later in the semester when we start working with colors, it will allow you to apply different pressure and also therefore, you know, it's going to mix better without having to deal with opacity or anything like that. So I just mix, you know, red and blue and I get a purple, right? That's basic. I'm not going to insult you by, um, oh yeah, okay, let's do that actually. Yeah, that's, it's a digression, but it's a good one. Another thing I'm teaching you about Photoshop right now that you need to know. So yes, I'm going to, I'm going to do that stuff that at first you will be like, is he fucking kidding? But you will see why I'm doing that. So here are the primary colors. And I know that if I mix them, I get the secondary colors, right? So please, all of you, tell me what I'm going to obtain when I mix my red and my yellow. All right, orange. 
But here is, a, here is the fun part. What do you think I'm gonna obtain when I mix the blue and the yellow? Green, green. Okay, <laughs> thanks for your participation. You are all wrong and I'm sorry to tell you this. Yes. You cannot get green in Photoshop like that. So obviously, obviously you were absolutely, you know, I don't have to tell you that you were right on mixing colors. You are supposed to obtain some green. Photoshop is green blind. That is probably connected to the RGB setting and everything. But you must be aware of that when you paint because if you're painting a scene, you know, like sky with a red sun and then, you know, this, the color mix and you have the orange and stuff like that, that works well. But if you are painting something in blue and then you have something in and you try to mix and you you assume that you will get your nice green, no, you will get that muddy gray. So with Photoshop, you need to go pick up your green in the color wheel. Yes. Uh, how do we set up our Photoshop on the right to look like yours, and how do we set up a brush like that? Yeah, okay, we, that is also something we are going to talk about. Um, we can talk about it right now. I don't know why, or oh, the stream has an issue, or oh, because I see my face again, which I, do you still see my shared screen? Okay. Well, it's just the streams then. Uh, so, first of all, okay, let's talk about Photoshop settings then, since we are on the 101 class. Um, Photoshop settings. So, sometime you will show up in class, for example, and find Photoshop looking. Oh, cool. Photoshop is discontinuing its, its 3D feature. Okay. Uh, you will show up and find Photoshop like this, for example, and the tools just like that. Okay, I'm just, just wait a second, I'm resetting the... Okay. And so you will find tools just like this and um, floating windows and just nothing looks like what you like. For me, this is not a problem. I just go right here and I'm like, like that. And I just reset everything, just like that. So, because what happened is that I saved my, my workspace. So that's something I want to talk about with you also and that will answer your question. Uh, I set up my workspace the same way. Okay, so let's let's have a serious talk about this. That's also an interesting conversation. You like your bedroom. This is you, this is a place you know you know where you have your bottle of water. You know where I don't know. You know where your clothes are. You know you don't spend five hours. You don't spend twenty minutes every morning looking for where your socks are because you know where they are, you know where you put them, okay? Your bedroom is organized and so is your living room and so is your car, you know? Your space, your personal space is tuned by your interaction with it. And so, Photoshop should be the same. You should not have to open Photoshop and look for your socks for 15 minutes because you don't know where you left them, right? Your Photoshop should be plug and play. You should turn it on and have everything where you know it's at, with your brushes, everything just li like you like it, so you are ready to work as soon as you start. And so, Photoshop does that very easily. You can just save your workspace with your name on it. So you can do that at school, for example, when you share a computer, but you can also do that at home if you, I don't know, maybe you share your your computer with a friend or, you know, or with, a, with a family member or, or whatever. And so everything in Photoshop is movable, right? I can take that, move it right here. I can take it back, 
wait for the blue line and leave it here. So what I do? What did I do? Oh yeah. Okay. I'm saying that and I'm just here we are. So I like to put those right here. So when I organize my Photoshop space, I know that I need three, four things, five things to work with. And it is exactly what you have in front of you right now. You can even make a screen capture of it if you want. So what I have here is a display that shows my colors, my layers. Here you have my brushes, right? And here you have adjustments. And here you have the navigator. The reason why I have the navigator, so the navigator is a tool that could be used to navigate into a feature. So if I'm zoomed in, I can use the navigator right there to move into the feature. I never use that. You can, but I never use it. The reason why I use, the way I use the navigator is because I paint a lot of magic cards. I like to have on the side an image that is the size of a magic card. This way, when I'm painting details, like I will be right now, let's say I'm working on the mouse and everything, I still have all the time without having to zoom out, a sample of my image at small size. Okay? So you always have that, di you always have that distance to look at. No matter how much details I put in the work, I can see right now if it looks good or not. So if I paint, I will use some bright pink so you can see it. If I paint like that, I do see, I do see it appearing on the side. I see if it's too bright, I see, you know, I see all the stuff. All right, so that's the way I use the navigator to just keep a distance on the overall composition, on the overall image. But anyway, in Photoshop, you have that on top in your menu bar, you have a place that says window. And um, do you see it, my students? Do you see, I clicked on window and I have a list right there. Do you see that? Yeah, so let's share, let's cancel that share screen and I will share, I will share the monitor. All right, so now that should be much better for you all. You should be able to see that if I click on the window, I have a list of stuff, right? Does that work? Okay. So that list, you can really use that as a, as a store. You can get what you want. And I can tell I have my colors, my layers, my navigators, my tools right there. That they are, they are checked, you know, they are here. If I uncheck the colors, my colors disappear. If I go to window again, my colors come back. So then you organize it as you want. You know, you can put your layers over the colors. You can, you know, you can, you can do as you want. I like, to, I like to leave a lot of room for layers because I am going to go crazy with my layers. I know that we are always talking into several hundreds when I paint uh, for complex illustrations. So, so that's it. Um, but that's the way it works. You know, you have something you don't need, like you don't need your channels right there. If you don't care about that, just get rid of it. You know, who cares? I keep my channels because I have a, a use for it, but that's uh, just my own stuff. Um, usually that little symbol that you have on the top right give you choices. So a lot of you, when you look at your colors in Photoshop, you see that, All right? Let me show you something else about this. What I don't like about it is that there is a repetition in there. So you have the bright saturated, oh, I missed an opportunity to do this. 
the bright saturated red. All right. My God, I'm, I'm so strange. I can't type this right. Then on the top left of that tube, you have completely bright. And then at the bottom, you have full black. But the problem is that at the bottom left, you have full black as well. So there is a repetition between both corners of that rectangle right there. And then in the middle, you have certain level of saturation, desaturation, light or bright. Okay. And that's the difference in the color in the color uh, square that you have right now. Basically, depending of where you go, you can really uh, have full saturated or brighter or darker. So brighter and darker, we are talking about values right there. But you can also have different level of saturation. And so that is the, the hue and saturation of your color. So wait a second. Um, what I do is that I go for something that I prefer by a lot. Instead of selecting the U cube, I select the color wheel. That will give you another system, a system that I personally like a lot more. That means that this time we don't have a repetition of the black. We have bright, saturated, dark. And also, all around it, you can select your color. So I can pick my green, for example, that Photoshop does not pick well. I can pick my green and I can decide if I want a highly saturated, a saturated but darker, a desaturated mid-range. Photoshop, be nice. See, I'm like, it's light but desaturated. I can have light but with more saturation. Darker, darker with more saturation. You know, we can, we can play with that. So basically with the color wheel, you select the color you want and then you decide. So basically I know right now, I know I'm selecting a strong red, but then I decide what type of red, you know, do I want that light desaturated red, that fully saturated red, that saturated darker red. That's why the color wheel is more efficient to me. Does that make sense? So I keep talking and stuff, but by the way, if any one of you in the chat have some questions and things that uh, you want to comment about, do not hesitate. Uh, once again, this is a space for my students, but I decided to open it for um, people who want to chip in and friends, you know, like I don't post that everywhere, but it's more like I just want that space to be kind of useful and also serve my students a bit better by having some friend artists who can chip in sometime if they want to. Um, and also it's a way for me to record those classes for my students who will miss it, like the, the four that are missing it today that we are not going to name. Um, your other question was about brushes, right? And my brushes are, there is a lot. All those are categories, right? Full of brushes everywhere. Um, I suggest that you start working with just a few brushes. In fact, I suggest that you start working with just this one. Just one brush. That's to me the ultimate brush that I work with. Of course, later you will use a lot more, but I think I work with like five different brushes most of the time and everything else is just an extra that comes when I need it. Um, and again, we'll talk about brushes sometime, but let's say I'm, I'm doing a quick concept and I need some, some pine trees in the back. Yeah, I can use that, you know. Thank you very much. But that's not what I want you to learn or to paint with. Not yet. Later, of course, but not yet. Right now, I want you to use a brush that, depending on the size of the brush, you can use it to paint and block some, you know, block some shapes and stuff. And you can also use it to sketch. 
just by reducing the size. It's also a really good sketching brush with like opacity depending on the pressure and everything. That's all you need in a way. And what I like with that brush is that it has also a little bit of texture due to the repetition of its pattern that shows up like that and it's nice. It's actually, it just makes it a little bit less visually boring than the completely flat brush, right? So that brush is available for you somewhere on the Discord. I will, I will send a link to that um, after the class, like in, in a few minutes. But this is kind of all you need, that one brush. I work with this one a lot too, because I like the fact that I can sketch with it. It, it has a bit more grit than the other one. But later on, I will share with you brushes that are a bit, a bit crazy, you know, like stuff like uh, I use that one in my artwork a lot because it comes with lots of texture in it. Um, I created a lot of brushes. I created a lot of brushes for Photoshop. I, no, not yet. Let me rephrase. For Adobe, like brushes that they commissioned from me. Uh, because I got totally into it. Like I love creating good brushes, brushes with different feels. Um, see, this one looks very similar to the others, but it has this kind of paintbrush aspect that I love. Um, and then, and then of course we have like, but we'll talk about Photoshop brushes in details soon, including the famous that makes students being like, what? You know? And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in details, but a brush is nothing else but one stamp that is repeated after the other. So if you set up your brush to follow your directions and repeat the stamp with a certain space in between and follow your direction, that's what you get. Okay? If I go to the settings of my brush right there and disconnect the fact that it's, it follows my direction, that's what we have. It's just a repetition of that stamp. If I reduce the space in between each stamp, so that brush has to be tuned specifically to have exactly the right distance in between the stamps and follow the direction for it to work. We will talk about brushes in details. I will teach you how to create your own brushes. For the ones of you who are following the stream, uh, that may be interesting also. This is like basic basic Photoshop things, but uh, it's part of learning how to uh, take care of your own tools. So I play a lot of guitar and, you know, we had a huge... Oh, so yeah, by the way, with Photoshop brushes, but one last thing I want to tell you uh, about using Photoshop brushes, you see me switching size of my brushes like that all the time really quickly and that's awesome because I can do this change like that go back to that you know and then with another button I can color pick you know so let's say I'm doing this and then I want this exact red right there I color pick it change the size I just have my fingers on control and option I always explain to my students as I'm going to explain that to you right now and I was t talking about guitars but you have rhythm in one hand and you have your fingers on the other side, on the keyboard. And that, the, the coordination between those two hands is what will allow you to do what I'm doing. But basically, if I put my finger on control and option on Mac, I don't know what it is on PC, but you will find out it's not difficult. If you put your fingers on control and option at the same time and go left and right, you change the size of the brush. When you release your finger, you can paint with it. Okay, does it work? We'll talk about that again when everyone has a graphic tablet and everything. And I encourage you to ask me like, hey, like, what did you share with us? Like, do not hesitate to make me talk again about something I talked about, especially since some students have missed that. Um, but anyway, you can do that. And if you go up and down, you will change the hardness of the brush or the opacity, I don't remember. Oh yeah, that's the opacity. You can change the opacity of the brush by going up and down, but don't do that don't change the opacity. The opacity should just be your pressure. 
Okay. So left and right, you can change the size of the brush and it's excessively convenient. And then I color pick with my finger on option on Mac. Okay, so if we have this and this, and if I want to pick this place right there in between, here we are, finger on option and that's it. You can also set that up on your stylus. I also have it set up on my stylus, but my stylus is set up more for navigation purposes and stuff like that. So. Again, we'll talk about that. Ask me again. Like it takes a while for you to get used to to get used to your tools. So do not hesitate to ask questions over and over if you need to ask those questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I don't, I don't hear you well. What is the difference between opacity and flow? Uh, it will give you something similar. You, I will work with flow and opacity at the maximum. Opacity is or translucent or transparent. The work is flow is the amount of painting that is projected on canvas. Okay, that's why on the side of flow you have that little aerograph symbol. Uh, but ultimately, it kind of does the same uh, ish. You can play with it, but I always have mine at 100%. Uh, another thing you can play with is smoothing. This one is interesting. So if I decide to make, oh, I will show you that later, but smoothing uh, will basically control a bit of your drawing. So I usually keep my smoothing at 10% uh, for my drawing because it just it just cleans your your drawing and it, it makes you sometime drawing with digital, you end up drawing not as well as you would um, on paper. You have less confidence and it's just, uh, it's just because of, you know, you are drawing on plastic pretty much. And so having just a bit of smoothing up, again, I like 10%, will give me that feeling of control um, that I have on paper and that sometimes I don't have with Photoshop. Before I let you go, I want to talk about that guitar thing I was going to talk about. Um, you know, it got really cold recently. And so my apartment was blowing air like crazy. Like I had the feeling I was living in a hairdryer. And the humidity went down at 10%. And what happens when humidity is very low, when everything is dry like that, that the wood shrinks, specifically on guitar, on guitar necks. And if you are familiar with what a guitar neck looks like, you have a lot of frets, metal frets, that are exactly aligned with the wood. When the wood shrinks, the metal of the fret does not shrink. And you end up with little blades that are you know, because the wood gets thinner, you, you can feel the little metal blade on your fingers when you play, and it, it can literally cut your fingers. And I had one guitar that was damaged like that, and so what I did is that uh, I went straight to some guitar supply store and bought the tools I needed to just grind and polish again, just a little bit, the fret of the guitar so they will align with the wood again. The reason why I'm telling you this, it's because it's about knowing how to tune your tools the way you like to tune it. Some of my guitar, I have a certain gauge of string that is lighter or heavier than some of my other guitars. I know that uh, it changes the tone, for example. So I just know how to tune my tools to have the result I want to have. And this is the way I will teach digital painting to you, whether you use Photoshop or Procreate, I will teach you how to uh, tune your tools, create your own brushes, set up your workspace, and build your habits with a sense of control. Like, you know what tool you are using. It's, it's, it's like driving, you know, you need to know your car, you need to know your tool. Um, so it's a lot about habits, routine, uh, comfort. I like to, you know, a lot of people see comfort as a negative thing sometimes, like, oh, you don't want, you want to step out of your comfort zone. 
uh, you don't want to get too comfortable because it's boring, you want some adventure, you want some craziness. Well, when it comes to work habit, to work habit, it's very important to have that comfort zone, that place where everything is stable, comfortable. You know your brushes, you know your tools, you know your computer, you know where everything you need is at. That's comfort right there. Like the comfort of a bed that you know that at the end of the day, you know where your bed is at. That comfort is important because if you have that comfort, then you can expand from that. Then you can explore. Then you can go on adventure. Then you can break that comfort. Okay? If you have five brushes that you like and you know to paint with them, then you can expand from that and change the settings and try new things because you can always go back to that comfort that you have built. So that balance between comfort and exploration is important. And before we explore, I just, like I did today, I just taught you a bit how to, like the beginning of how to get comfortable with Photoshop as your own place. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, it's problematic that students, some students miss that class. When they will ask, okay, what did we talk about? I will be like, oh my, a lot of important stuff, in fact. Sorry, I keep looking up because I see my students upstairs, so I'm bringing everyone back in front of me. Here we are. Um, do you have questions before we end this class today? Starting Monday, sorry, on Monday, I may post a first side assignment that I want you to complete sometime before Wednesday. If you don't see me posting it, it's because I decided to wait for whatever reason. So don't worry about it. If you see it, you do it. If you don't see it, you don't do it. You just don't, don't have to worry about that. Um, on, next, on Wednesday, next Wednesday, I guess we are going to have a short recap of what we have talked about today for the students who missed the class. And uh, after that, I'm going to start showing you how to paint with values and I'm going to um, we are going to start talking about landscape, characters, and all the things that you need to know before you actively start working on the first project. All right. I hope this was not boring. Uh, I'm going to disconnect the stream. So before I disconnect the students. So thank you very much, the ones who tuned in. We are going to we are going to do that every week, most likely. So Today was the first, the first class with like some very basic content, but we are going to accelerate and gain some speed during the semester soon. So thank you, thank you for tuning in.